I am so glad you have joined us for worship. As always, we hope this time will bring you a greater sense of peace, strengthen your faith, but we also hope it might challenge your thinking, open up your mind to new possibilities. Let's worship. Come, thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet Sung by flaming tongues above Praise the mount, I'm fixed upon it Mount of thy redeeming love I find my greatest treasure, hither by thy help I've come. And I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger me with his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be, let thy Our reading today comes from the Gospel of Luke. As the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire his winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary, but the shaft he will burn with unquenchable fire. Now, when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved, and I am well pleased. Let us pray. 
God of light and love, on this day you remind us that we are marked by you to be witnesses to your light of hope. When the heavens opened at Jesus' baptism, it is then that your love also poured out for each of us. Help us to be people who are ready to be involved in the ministries of peace and justice, bringing the light of your hope to the world. Open our hearts that we may be inspired to serve you by shining your light for all to see. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, bless now these waters of baptism for Silas. For just as your spirit moved over the waters of creation, bringing forth all life, we pray that you will move upon these waters of baptisms, that you might bring forth in him the fullness of life. O oh God, just as it was your spirit in the form of Moses parting the waters of the Red Sea, leading the Hebrews to freedom, be now upon these waters of baptism for Silas, leading him to freedom. And, O oh God, just as it was you in the form of Christ walking upon the waters of Galilee, walk now upon these waters, that Silas might know he is never alone. You are always with him. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So as Holly and Brian, as parents of Silas, I first ask you, do you desire to have Silas baptized into the faith and family of Jesus Christ? Yes, we do. Will you grow alongside him in faith and hope? Yes. And will you teach Silas to love his neighbor as himself? Yes, we will. Okay. And as godparents, you represent the wider circle of people that must surround every child if they are to grow into fullness. And so I ask you, will you be alongside this family offering your love and support as Silas grows in stature and wisdom? Okay. Silas, on behalf of the Church Universal, I baptize thee in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Mother and Father to each of us. Amen. <laughs> now we come to the sermon time. Juan Carlos will offer a good word, but hey, let's try it a little differently today. Would it be okay if I came in and asked a few questions? I would love that. <laughs> let's do it. I can still remember my baptism. Yes, I know often you think of baptism, you think of little babies who are coming to us and, and you hear their coos and their cries and, and sometimes as a pastor, I just, I'm just praying that they don't scream too loud. But see, I was 13 years old when I came to the waters of baptism and I came into the waters in an ocean. There was this ocean before me. I, could, I can still hear the waves and feel the salty water in my mouth. And I still remember my dad, who was the, my pastor at the time, uh, and one of the elders of the church alongside him. And I still remember the words, I baptize you. And they leaned me back into that salty water. For that one moment, I held my breath. And I came out of those waters and I gasped. <gasps> Reborn, yes, reborn in such an interesting way, isn't it? So anytime I hear about baptism, I can remember that moment in my life. But then this passage says some things that strike my own imagination. This John the baptizer and, and Jesus, the one that we claim is God's own beloved son comes to this place and, and he says he wants to be baptized. And, and I wonder about that. Why, why? I mean, if there's somebody who should not have to be baptized, it's Jesus, right? And yet here he comes. And then something else happens that grasps my imagination. And that is that uh, the text tells us that for one moment after Jesus comes out of the water, we hear God's voice. This is my son my beloved one, he who I'm pleased with. There's a dove that comes down. It is quite a picture for those of us who are reading this text. And then I think about that moment of my own baptism. I didn't hear a voice. 
But something happened in me that day. Something about me being beloved. Something about me being one whom God is pleased with. And ever since then, I've had to remember that. Because there have been some times where I did not think that God was happy with me. To be honest, there have been those times when I did not feel like God felt like I was a beloved one and where I didn't feel like God was one who beloved me either. When I've wondered who this God is and what that means. And then I remember this baptism of Jesus. And I realized something. That's why Jesus was baptized. Because this Jesus was like me and you. We too find ourselves in those places where we need to know who this God is. I'm reminded of John Sobrino, who is a Latin American theologian who reminds us that this God that we proclaim in Christianity is a God who aligns with those who are the least and the last and the lost and the suffering and the struggling and the poor and the questioning and the doubters and the cynics. And that in baptism, we too come alongside and we too align ourselves with those folk. So Jesus at that moment did just that. Align God's self with people like you and me and the many others in the world who struggle. All human beings whom God made. And reminds us at that moment that we gasp for new air. And that new air is a reminder of new life of our belovedness, of who this God is, truly God with us. Amen. Juan Carlos, whenever you're preaching, I feel like my faith is strengthened. And your preaching is already beginning to shape First Plymouth's ministry and mission. Let me ask you something. Is my impression right that part of what your preaching is embedded in is that you came from a very evangelical background and then yet somehow in your process of life and and living you move towards a more inclusive justice oriented Christianity and it's that mixture am I hearing that correctly well yeah right I mean I was I grew up in a tradition that took this text in such literal ways and made me memorize the text as a child a Bible quizzing things like that and, and made me live in the text. And by the way, I'm really thankful that they did. It came with an edge though, mm. an edge that in the end made me walk away from that kind of tradition. But, but deep within was the sense that this text mattered, these stories mattered. And, and, and for sure then, actually it was this text and the renewal of it in my life that made me begin to ask some questions mm. and made me begin this journey that has landed me here where I am today. I love that mixture that you're thankful for that past and yet have found ways to evolve beyond it in certain ways. Is that? Yeah, and, and I, I have to say that because there were painful aspects. Yeah. And I think anyone who, who might be out there who's listening to me knows that edge of judgment and shame, mm. that edge of, of using a sacred story to, to beat you up and to exclude you, um, I get that. Mm. And yet, what I found was that it was not really the stories, if you actually get into these stories, these are stories of grace and mercy and forgiveness and reconciliation and a, messy, a God who's in the messiness of life. It's the way that I was told those stories were interpreted, how, how they, this tradition told me they should be seen that, that did that stuff within my soul. So I'm getting to do something we never get to do in church, like interrupt the preacher and <laughs> ask him questions. Don't get any thoughts in your mind, by the way. But, but here, digitally, yeah. we can do this. I think I heard something about the conception of God taking place in this sermon. Let me see if that's true. It, with this baptismal moment, you aligned God with real human beings, uh, those in need, the suffering, Oftentimes, theologically, we imagine when we hear the voice, 
with whom I am well pleased. It's this abstract theological entity, this, this God that is somehow either judging whether God is pleased or not, and that's a declaration. You made a different little move there. Was I hearing that right? Yeah, right. So uh, I'm a student of Latin American liberation theology um, and Ella Curia and Boff and John Sobrino and, and Ada Isasi Diaz, Ada Maria Isasi Diaz. The, these folks were trying to figure out who is this God in light of the suffering in Latin America. This was back in the 60s. And one of the things that they began to help us see was this, that, that this God became enfleshed as a way to align God's self with the humanity of ours, like in all, in all its forms, and especially with the struggling, especially with the poor, especially with those who suffer, because th this community that this God was born into, this first century Judaism and this first century Palestine, these folks were truly struggling. And so this God comes alongside. So, so you're right. I remember hearing it as a child, as this big voice from heaven, you are here, and you I'm well pleased. And I'm like, oh my goodness, am I gonna be pleasing to God? Oh goodness, I mean, this voice, I didn't hear that voice when I was baptized, when in reality, I was getting it all wrong. <laughs> God was pleased and Jesus was beloved because this was God who took human form and was willing in that moment actually to, to become subservient right, to come alongside and do what the other humans were doing. They were hungry, they were struggling, they were looking for an answer. They, they were wondering where God was. And so Jesus comes to the baptismal moment and submits to that reality. And there it is, the belovedness, there it is. And that, that Jim, has captured my imagination, continues to, and, and that's one of the reasons why I'm sitting here in front of you uh, today. Boy. Thank you. And, you know, in the Christian community, we do have to oscillate between different conceptions of God. Now, you've just embedded it and embodied it and, and aligned it, again, with the suffering and the poor and the struggling, which is so powerful. But so, too, as Christians, we have to have some sort of theological, even maybe a little more abstract notion of God at times. Now, that can't subvert the struggle for justice. Um, and that's what's tricky, to make sure your, your more theological conceptions of God don't actually cut against what God's love requires, that yeah. justice, that healing, that wholeness. Yeah. So, so part of that is the, the mystery of this, who this God is. So um, there, there's an idea of the God who is hidden. So yes, we experience this God aligning God's self with the suffering and the struggling and and having a deep connection with that. But, but then there's this other notion, which is that just like, no matter how much I get to know you, Jim, there are parts of you that I'll never know. You're lucky. Right? <laughs> you don't want to know hey, everything about hey, me. Hey, amen, right? I, me, the same thing here, right? But, but God even more, that there are these aspects of this transcendent one yeah. that we cannot ever comprehend. And one of those, I might push a bit, and that is, that one of those is, how can this God love people so radically? How can this God be so in love with creation in those ways? And I think that's part of that hiddenness, that transcendence that we might not quite ever understand, but we don't have to understand it. Yeah. We just have to embody it and live it. Thank you. You know, sometimes I really worry as a pastor about people's image of God or conception of God, and we keep trying to nuance that in our sermons for folks, because if you have understandings of God um, that you later come to question or you see that they were incorrect, you can lose your faith altogether because that was your God, What these notions you had. I mean, often when someone tells me they don't believe in God, I say to them, tell me a little bit about this God you don't believe. Mm -hmm. And everything they say, I don't believe that either. You know, like God's an old man with a beard up on the top of the clouds, or, or God is this uh, judging. judging, angry. Um, and, and, and so instead of, of whether you believe in your own image of God, we have to constantly be called to a larger, more Christic, more loving, more just image of God. Yeah, yeah, and also a more mystery, um, more awe, more wonder, more curiosity, more creativity. Um, I think one of the things that helps me too uh, to think about that in my own life is 
I remember walking away and feeling so lost because I had, I think J.B. Phillips speaks of the God as policeman. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the God that I kind of believed in. This God that was always out kind of looking, make sure that I behaved like, like a Santa Claus type of thing and naughty or nice. What is one up to? Uh, but then to, to recognize that God was larger than anyone's imagination, yeah. including mine, yeah, including yours, yeah. but also the church. Yeah. Or the including preacher? the church's imagination. Yes, right. including the church's imagination. God is beyond any Christian doctrine. Yes, any... or Christianity itself. Yeah, yeah. And yes. so all of a sudden, that kind of shook me, but then, then he paved this way that made me even more curious. And I, then, then all of a sudden, I began to approach this text called the Bible in a very different way. Um, and there are a few other ways there around my own cultural context that helped me. There is a, a genre of literature called magical realism. Uh -huh. Gabriel Garcia Marquez yeah, yeah. is the best known of these writers. And, and, and that way of looking at text helped me imagine a new way of thinking about this God and, and how that God related to me and to the whole world and to the whole of creation while keeping this mystery and awe and wonder uh, alongside that. And I feel like I just pulled you into some wonderful abstractions, and thank you for that. But I, I may have pulled you away from the heart of what your sermon was. At least I felt you saying that in your baptism, in your sense of this baptismal moment in Scripture, you know you are one of God's beloved, as every single person is one of God's beloved, and that that is a call to make sure we tend to each other as God's beloved. I want everyone to know no matter who you are, your story, that God speaks this word for you. Amen. And that as we come alongside one another in these times, in these times of isolation, in these times of questions, in these times of struggle, in these times of disorientation, we're being called into the waters, into the promise of a God who says, yes, you're beloved, into a God who knows where you are, where we are, and aligns with us in solidarity and that that seals the deal. That seals the deal. And so I hope you hear today that same baptismal declaration from the heavens, this is my beloved, my child. With you, I am well pleased. friend.
And so we hope that our worship today has strengthened your faith, opened your heart. Go forth into this week, confident that you are a child of God. Follow in Christ's way. Return no one evil for evil. Do good. Go in peace.